your Bible, if you would, to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6, and we will read the first seven verses. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 6, and beginning in verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? He showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. And therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it. The title of my message this afternoon is, And the Iron Did Swim. And I think I was taught that you never start a sentence or a title with a conjunction, and, but there is a reason to use the exact phrasing in that phrase of that particular verse, and the iron did swim. If we had lived in Elisha's day, we would have been very surprised by the spiritual lethargy and coldness and apostasy. And Elisha himself must have wondered when he saw Elijah taken up, you recall the account. Elijah fighting the same apostasy, religious degradation. And Elisha himself must have wondered what will become of the Lord's work? Elisha himself, with that heartfelt cry, Elijah went up, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He was emoting this terrible loss, not just of his mentor. Elijah mentored Elisha for seven or eight years. But I believe he was verbalizing the great loss to the nation of Israel, or at least to those who had ears here. And yet we know that God never leaves himself without a witness. And God works all things after the counsel of his perfect will. And Elisha himself would be now the man of the hour. Elisha would be that vessel whom God would use to further his work, to perform miracles, to teach, and to do many other things. Now, Elisha, there's very little written about his personal biography. There's very little we know about Elisha. When we read the accounts of uh, when he is doing this or teaching that, it's very disjointed. And we'll come upon these spots where he appears and seems to do many wonderful things. But he himself, uh, we don't know much about. Nevertheless, we do know that he was a mighty prophet of God and did many things. And I'd like to look at this one particular miracle that he was involved with this afternoon with you. And so we're going to look at just a very brief exposition of these seven verses, just a very brief overview of them. And then we're going to look at four uh, applications or four observations from this passage. I believe there's five in your uh, outline, I told Peter 5, uh, and I started off with more than that, but I felt I had to, had to narrow it down. So, in the first place this afternoon, let's just go verse by verse and make a few notes about uh, some of the phrases, some of what's happening, and then we'll use that as a point of departure to, to look at a few lessons. Verse 1, we're confronted with this thing called 
the sons of the prophets, or the prophet's school. This phrase does not intend to point us to, to the full-time job that the parents of these children in the school have. You know, the parents were prophets, and here are the sons of the prophets. Rather, this phrase is focusing on this school of the prophets. These are men that have been already sanctioned by God as prophets. They've been set aside into that office. And Elisha here is further teaching, further exampling to them what it means to be a prophet of the Lord. There were three schools of the prophets, one at Bethel, one at Jericho, one at Gilgal. And I believe this particular school of the prophets was at Gilgal based on its proximity to the Jordan River that we uh, read about. It appears that the prophets that God gathered about were young men, but again, they were already instructed in the scriptures. They knew the truth of divine revelation. They would be perhaps a current and even perhaps the next generation of God's people. This was an intensely spiritual environment. This was not a Bible college or seminary that anybody who fills out an application can go to and attend. These men were handpicked by the Lord to be a prophet. And Elisha, you can assume, with Elisha as the teacher, Elisha who was mentored by Elijah for seven or eight years, Elisha would inculcate a very spiritual environment, a very spiritual atmosphere. Verse 2, let us go to Jordan and take every man a being and let us make a place there where we may dwell. Notice that everybody is involved. Let every man take a being. Let all of us go and do this work. I myself have never chopped down trees, I've cut kindling with a little hand axe, but I've never chopped down trees, but I can imagine chopping a tree with an axe is hard work. And the ministry, which is all encompassing, is not just preaching and teaching, but the ministry really is hard work, is it not? There's sweat and labor and muscles and, and grind and dirt involved. It's all-encompassing. As you know, godliness and spirituality is not simply going just to church, or it's not, uh, my favorite phrase, it's not just reading the Puritans and sipping tea in front of the fire. Mm -hmm. It's intersecting people's lives. It's, 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 it's involvement. It's labor. It's work. These men, all of them, are willing to go and pitch in and do what they can do. Let me say something also about the word dwell. Let us go that we may dwell there. It's actually the word that means let us sit before. Let us sit before thee. So I'm thinking it's really like a retreat center that they want to build. They're not going to build themselves a dormitory or a house. But it seems to be a retreat center where they can have a super focused, a super concentrated time away from the ordinary, away from the everyday, to get this teaching, this, uh, this impartation of these spiritual gifts from the prophet Elisha. Verse 3, Elisha says upon being asked that he would go. There seems to be a very apparent thought here, not only in asking his permission, but asking him to go with them, that they would not have gone if Elisha had said, I'm not going to go with you. They understood that they needed him. They had this deep sense. Elisha was like the voice of God to them. And they needed to hear from God. They needed his word. They needed instruction. And Elisha acquiesces, I will go. Elisha, willing to serve in whatsoever capacity, it's, it's amazing if you read through the miracles that he was involved with and some of his prophecies. 
He is there. Pitching, working, ministering, laboring. I mean, here's Elisha going out in the woods to fell some trees to build a, a school or a retreat center or uh, just a room for this school of the prophets. And this mundane work of chopping down a tree with an axe was not beneath him. In verse 4 and verse 5, we read the account of this trial in the midst of the work. There's a problem. There's a stoppage. There's an issue. One of the prophets, chopping a tree, loses his axe head. The axe flying, head of flying off the handle and hopelessly lost into the Jordan River. We'll say something else about the Jordan River later, but, the, but at this point, let me say that the Jordan River at this school of the prophets near Gilgal is a dead river. The Jordan River runs from Lake Gennesaret in the north down to the Dead Sea in the south, almost a straight line dividing Israel in two. And when it leaves the north, it's, it's coming from Mount Hermon, it's at an elevation, the water's clear, it's living, it's got a good purpose. But as it descends, Jordan means descent. As it descends down to the Dead Sea, it collects salts, it collects clay, and it actually becomes becomes a dead river. Climatologists estimate that every year 850,000 tons of salt enter the Dead Sea through the River Jordan. The River Jordan is at that point in that area, it's muddy, it's murky, it's as a river goes, not the kind of one that uh, you would want to go swimming in. We can be assured that when the axe had fell into the Jordan at this point, it was irrecoverable. It was lost. He couldn't just wade out from the shore and pick it up. And then in verse 6, we see this miracle where in order to get this back, the prophet cuts down a stick or a tree, casts it into the Jordan River, and the iron does swim. If you think about this miracle, it's actually a very astounding miracle. It's stunning. And I'll tell you why. Most of the times you read about miracles in the Scripture, they are on a grand and glorious scale. 5,000 people are fed. The wind stops, the waves become calm, the dead are raised to life, leprosy is healed. Here, a miracle occurs to retrieve part of a tool, an axe head. From that vantage point, this miracle is quite out of place. It's, it's very stunning, I believe. There's no grand end, no glorious purpose for this particular miracle. It's very, very insignificant thing. And yet the man of God is used for the raising of this axe head, this iron. And then, of course, in that verse 7, we see that aspect of human agency, of human responsibility, where the prophet instructs then his prophet, pick it up, take it up, and we can assume subsequently use it. Well, with that very brief overview, I'd like to now share with you four uh, observations that I think will further develop some of the things that are happening in this passage. Number one, the child of God desires to see an expansion of God's work. The child of God, the true child of God, has a heart that desires to see an enlargement and increase of God's work. And I'm not talking about building a building or enlarging a campus or adding ministries. I'd like to confine our thinking to your heart. As a child of God, you should have a desire that there would be an increase, an enlargement, a development 
of your Christianity, of your knowledge of Christ, of your walk with Him, of your knowledge of His Word in your hearts. The sons of the prophets said, the place where we are dwelling, the place we are living is very narrow. It's straight. It's small. Oh, could you help us? Could you go with us to build a bigger place? A larger place? And again, I'd like to focus just on the individuality of you as a person, of you as a Christian. How is it with you? Do you desire to see an enlargement, an increase of God's work in your heart? Of course, on the grand scale, with a larger vision, we desire to see the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We want to see the Word of God go from uh, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the other parts of the earth. But we also don't want to, if you'll pardon the pun, here, miss the forest for the trees. We want to ensure that our heart, our desires, are parallel with the thoughts of these sons of the prophets. Our Hearts. Let me give you three sub-points or three words along these lines. The words are desire, presence, and consecration. Desire, presence, and consecration. First of all, desire. When Christ lives in your heart by faith, there very typically is an inward conviction of our smallness, our narrowness, our limitations, our smallness of faith, the lack of understanding the depth of the riches of God's Word. And I believe the Holy Spirit puts this within us. And I've never met a Christian who, after becoming born again, has a desire to stay in a state of equilibrium or to stay in a, in a static state. They want to grow. But they very often typically associate growth with head knowledge, experience, or some other thing. The sons of the prophets dwelling with Elisha are conscious of the straightness, the narrowness of their dwelling, and they want to see an enlargement, an expansion, and so it is with the child of God. More room for Christ. More room for true holy fellowship. And with this desire, there comes action. Something happens when we have that desire, because that desire, by definition, must work itself out, must have a result. And in keeping with this imagery of this, this schoolroom or this retreat center where, where these men are going to get alone, get alone with Elisha for that, that super focused or concentrated time with him, I would suggest that if you have this desire, like the sons of the prophets have, then you have this desire, this, this, a, a want for a private place and a way place where the Word of God takes on that special, that deep, that new meaning. Fellowship with Christ through the means of His Word. His Word, which is divine, eternal, abiding. That revelation of God Himself to us. Wouldn't it be wonderful to go to a retreat with Elisha as the teacher. How much more wonderful would it be to be at a retreat with Christ in the midst as the teacher? I think by way of application, this is the imagery that I think the child of God can, can say amen to, can, can, can correlate with. A place away, a time away, because, Lord, I feel that right now everything is so straightened and narrow and, and condensed. I want enlargement. I want an increase. 
let us go and do this thing. Desire manifests itself in action. Let us go. The sons of the prophet said, that's a good model. Let us go and build this place. But the second word is presence. The sons of the prophets absolutely had to have Elisha with them. Did they not? So the child of God needs the abiding presence of Christ or else everything is lifeless. We don't know who this one was who spoke on behalf of the group, but we sense that he echoed everybody's conviction, everybody's thought. Someone said this, that the presence of the Lord is the Christian's joy, his pavilion in trial and temptation and danger, his light in darkness, and his life in death. You can't go to that place without Christ if you want it to be blessed, if you want it, don't want it, want it to be own. You recall that account on the road to Emmaus when after Christ expounded to them everything that was in the scriptures about himself, whether it was in Moses or the law or the prophets or the Psalms. And those two disciples said, did not our heart burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures. I think very often that, that burning time is, is too infrequent, not as common as it should be. And yet I believe the Holy Spirit has this, this desire to open up the scriptures to us, testifying to us of Christ, of his redemptive work. So we have desire, we have presence, then we have consecration. I actually don't like this word because I think it's been misused by our dispensational friends, but I, I can't think of another word. But you'll notice that in our passage, it's very significant that they went to the Jordan River for this expanding work. And if the Jordan River has any typical or spiritual meaning in the scripture, it speaks of self-denial. It speaks of separation. It speaks of death. It speaks of denial. It speaks of God's work with some definite line of demarcation. Something definite happening. The Jordan River in the scripture, as I mentioned, it, it's used very, very often. And God, in a very pivotal way, uses it to get his people to this point where they, they, as we read, do not trust any longer in themselves, but in God who raises the dead. God instructed the Israelites to go up to the east side of the Dead Sea and cross the Jordan River into Canaan. It would have been much simpler had God told them to go to the west side and they would not have had to cross the Jordan at all. But God had a purpose for them to go to the Jordan and cross there. The Jordan River used, used in the life of David and, and Elijah and Elisha. Um, the Lord was baptized in the Jordan. Again, the Jordan River, very pivotal in Israel's history, very significant in many, many different places. But it does speak of Self-denial speaks of loss, speaks of death, speaks of giving up and giving over to God. The very name Jordan means the descent. The Jordan River actually is about a quarter of a mile below sea level as it gathers death, emptying out into the Dead Sea. So desire. Self-denial, consecration, presence. How is it with you? Do you have this affinity with the sons of the prophets? Where you don't even have to be told or encouraged, but you have this, this longing that the work of Christ 
would be carved out in your life in a bigger way, in a fuller way, that there would be this enlargement of his work. As the sons of the prophets had this knowledge and, and did something so that it could happen, so it should be with the child of God. Second observation, note that you as a Christian would do well to remember the awesome requirement of faithfulness that comes with being a steward. You as a Christian would do well to remember the, the awesome responsibility of faithfulness that comes with being a steward. In verse 5, this prophet who lost the axe head said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Now, I'm not going to jump on this guy's case and say that he was not faithful as a steward. I have another tack I want you to think about with me. He's chopping away. The axe head flies off into the Jordan River. It's lost. It's irrecoverable. And what comes out as very pointed issue is it was not his. It was borrowed. It would have been bad enough if he lost it, his own item. But from the sense of the text, it appears he would not be able to find it nor replace it. And so he has to bring Elisha into his plight. I'm drawing a correlation in the New Testament with this idea of steward. You are a steward, a guardian, or a manager. And there's a tremendous responsibility that is associated with you as a steward. You as a guardian. For example, look at your Bible. Don't look at a verse or a, a, a chapter. Just look at the book. That book is not yours. This book is not yours. You might have bought it. It might have your name in those gold embossed letters. But this book is not yours. It belongs to God. It's His Word. And when we use His Word to minister to others, to guide others, to teach others, we have to remember the awesome responsibility of using something that is not ours. It's borrowed. It's lent to you. And you are to exercise proper stewardship or guardianship with it. Go back to this man who's chopping the tree. He loses its, his, its axe head as it flies off the handle. What was he doing as he was chopping the tree? Was he, was he uh, showing off, um, competing with, with the brother next to him? Who could chop down the tree fastest? You know, a Paul Bunyan type, a macho spirit. Was he careless? Not ensuring the, the integrity of the joint between the axe head and the handle? Was he not using the tool properly? You know that, you probably heard that saying, fly off the handle. Oh, my boss really flew off the handle today. I mean. that, that phrase actually comes from on the frontier when people on the frontier would carve from a piece of wood a handle. And they would get an actual axe head from the East Coast, from a factory, and they would try to fit the two together. And the axe head coming off was a regular occurrence. And it, and it was a phrase to signify something that can, can happen so quickly, something can happen carelessly, perhaps it's a loss of self-control, somebody loses their cool. But, but harm and hurt can, reserve, can result from it. And if you're around a bunch of people chopping trees, I trust you. You don't want to be anywhere near someone who's going to lose an accent because it can kill you. But what about the ministry? What about the stewardship of God's Word? They are all borrowed. Ministry opportunities are borrowed. Spiritual gifts are borrowed. The Word is borrowed. Your very life is borrowed. You are not your own. Unregenerate man out there does not even own his life. 
Just because he does not bow the knee to Christ doesn't mean he now belongs to himself. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It is all borrowed. And so if it is borrowed, we cannot afford to be showing off in competition with somebody else, careless, not using the tool properly. Cannot afford to be cavalier. Sometimes we get into the rut of ministry and it's, it's a, in a sense it's a cavalier attitude where we don't stop and think once again, every opportunity is a brand new opportunity, a borrowed opportunity that does not belong to me. So I need to be faithful as a steward. Paul said this was the great requirement of a steward. He said it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. Are you faithful with what has been entrusted to you? Do you understand and recognize that it's all borrowed? It belongs to the Lord of glory. And in his perfect will and purpose and plan, he entrusts some of those riches to his own that they might dispense those riches elsewhere and use them to, to buy gospel spiritually, figuratively speaking. We, should, we would do well to remember we're stewards and we need to be faithful. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, note that Elisha's ministry was one of reconciliation and restoration. Elisha's ministry was one of reconciliation and restoration. Immediately upon hearing of this plight, the prophet begins to put into action this, this recovery, this restoration. And a ministry of reconciliation or recovery ought to be our response to the mistakes, the problems, the errors, the difficulties, the misjudgments of others, rather than a ministry of a critical spirit, or a judgmental spirit, or a, a more spiritual than thou attitude. How do you suppose Elisha acted when this man came to him and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed? What do you suppose was the inflection of Elisha? Ah, where did it fall? What did you do? Were you careless? Were you showing off? Do you suppose Elisha jumped all on his case and browbeated him? Do you suppose Elisha got on him for, for taking Elisha away from a, perhaps a more important work to help him find a loose axe head? Do you suppose Elisha pointed him to the law and said, said, man, don't you know that, that a head coming off an axe handle is a common occurrence, so common that the Deuteronomy talks about it, that if, if an axe head falls off and kills somebody, you've got to flee to the city of refuge. You could have killed somebody. What were you thinking? What were you doing? Was Elisha like that? Or do you suppose his body language, his expressions, his words, where did it fall? I want to help. I'm going to help if I can. What can we do? And this normally was Elisha's response. Earlier in, I believe it's chapter 2, when the sons of the prophets wanted to go look for Elijah after he was taken up, Elisha just, just although he said, don't do it, but he was very fatherly towards them. When there was the account of the death in the pot, Elisha is there on the spot to heal right away. Elisha had this ministry of reconciliation, of restoration, recovery, rather than a critical spirit, a, a judgmental spirit. The reason this jumped out to me when I was reading through this passage is simply this. For myself, I've lost a lot of axe heads. I've lost the handle. I chopped down the wrong tree. I chopped the tree down and it fell in the Jordan and then it, it slipped away before I could grab it and pull it up to shore. 
I've got chips on people, figuratively speaking. And what has happened to me, not here at CBC, in other places, I quite frankly was met with a lot of criticism, judgment, lectures, sarcasm, gossip, and all these things. I knew that I was the one that got the axe head in the river. And there is a time for rebuke and there's a time for correction. But should not we have a ministry of recovery and restoration, especially in the household of faith, especially between brethren? The Bible says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falleth. Yea, he shall be held up because God is able to make him stand. There will always be problems in the ministry. There will always be roadblocks, mistakes, errors in judgment. But friends, we should, we should first and foremost be as Elisha was with this, this attitude of restoration, recovery. Some of you know I've, I've been taking a, a weekly class, a counseling class up at North Creek Church. Um, going there with uh, Brother Ernie here. And uh, just this past week, the, the teacher, there's about 150 people in this class, he was talking about what it is to help an unbeliever and what it is to help a believer. And he said, you know, it's almost easier to help the unbeliever because they're just doing and acting what they know how to do. It's normal for them to act outside of grace. And you make certain allowances and you understand and you're there to help. But then sometimes when you're trying to minister to a Christian, they either know too much or they're in self-preservation mode uh, or they want to have you know, a, a spiritual doctrinal dueling. And when he said that, almost the whole class chuckled. Because that is their experience. And in fact, sometimes it's more difficult to interact with the believer. And that ought not to be. Reconciliation. Restoration. Recovery. Elisha was there. He didn't say, well, brother, I'll go pray for you. I'll pray for you. Maybe you'll find the accent. Maybe you'll find the money to buy a new one. He did not say, well, God is sovereign. Um, praise Him for His sovereignty. Elisha was there to help him. So what does a ministry of recovery look like? You need to look no farther than Jesus Christ. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, if he lose part of a tool, not even the whole tool, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until it is found. That's recovery. Until it is found. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders. He identifies with it. And he rejoices. It's not a duty. He rejoices. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. He even wants others to enter into his ministry of recovery. That which... I, I have found my sheep, that which was lost. That's a ministry of recovery. What does a ministry of restoration look like? One of the Messianic Psalms says this, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies, wrongfully are mighty. And then I restored that which I did not take away. Then I restored that which I did not take away. Christ came to restore something to you that He did not take away. You took it away from yourself. You lost it in the garden. And He comes down and He recovers to you that thing. He takes away your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. He takes your sin and penalty and guilt and shame all upon Himself. He didn't earn that. But He takes it away from, that you might be recovered. Elisha didn't have anything to do with the lost iron, did he? 
and yet he's there to help and cover it. What does the ministry of reconciliation look like? Scripture says, All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Why do we just keep that in the realm of evangelism? And we don't think that that has a more broader context. He's given you the ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's committed unto us that word, that ministry, that service of reconciliation. So, how is it with you? Do you have this ministry of reconciliation, of recovery, of help? Fourthly and lastly, in this account, we see a beautiful picture of the gospel. In verse 6, the man of God said, Where fell it? He showed him the place. He cut down a stick. He cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. The iron did swim. The stick was cut, cast in and, that is as a result of that, the iron did swim. Kids, do sticks float? You would say they do. In this account, the stick sank and the iron swam or floated. That which should have floated sank. And that which should have stayed on the bottom rose to the surface. Do we not see here that one aspect of the gospel, that great exchange that the gospel speaks of, where Christ exchanges his perfect righteousness and takes for that, that punishment, that sin, that guilt, that you deserve. The thing that floated sank, and the thing that sank, the iron floated. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I said this miracle was not on a grand and glorious scale. Actually, it points to the grandest, highest scale miracle that ever happened in the full and finished work of Jesus Christ. Like the axe head, we were lost, down in the muck and the mire, irrecoverable, covered with silt, ruined, useless, lost. That place where the axe head was lost, the Jordan River, which speaks of separation, which speaks of death, that line of demarcation between the wilderness and the promised land. We were lost in dead and trespasses and sins. Elisha cuts down this tree or this stick. You're familiar with Galatians 3 and 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That passage in Galatians is pulled out of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, that word tree, which is used 162 times, is the same word that is used here in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 6. It's referring to to Christ's redemptive work. Again, another messianic psalm, Christ is speaking in it. He talks about all the waves and the billows have gone over me as I go down to the depths. But blessed be God, He accomplishes that for which He was sent. The iron does swim. The iron doesn't simply float as an inanimate object. The iron swims, pointing us to the fact that now that which was dead 
is alive and raised to newness of life. And that further and follow on instruction. Put out your hand and take hold of it. Even as Paul tells Timothy, he says, we are commanded to take hold of eternal life. There is that human agency, that human responsibility, that response to God's action. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Do you have a desire for an expansion of His presence in your life, an enlargement of His work? Do you want to have a renewed impression that you are not your own, that everything is borrowed, and you want to be impressed with that reality that will move you to a sobriety and a solemnness as you minister, as you help, as you work for the Lord? Do you see the need for an abs the absolute need for a ministry of reconciliation, recovery, help, as opposed to a critical spirit, a judgmental spirit, a legalistic spirit? then I simply say to you, you must put your trust in the one who can make the iron swim. As insignificant, as small as that is, that is the subject of this miracle. Would God not also, in light of that, be more desirous to equip you in these other areas? so that you can live unto His glory and for your edification. What if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth? What if you are unsure whether you are in the faith or not in the faith? Has the gospel really been applied to your heart and your life? You too must trust the one who makes the iron swim. Don't trust in yourself, but trust in God who raises the dead. That characterizes the work of God. That characterizes the gospel. He puts in life where there is death. He raises that which is dead and should not be raised. He raises it in newness of life. He takes out a, a dead heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. This is the business he is in. For may God be pleased to write His word upon our hearts, encouraging us, edifying us, and building us up in our faith. Let's pray. Father, we are always thankful for Thy word that is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We're thankful, our Father, for the instruction and the guidance that Your word does give to us. And Father, we marvel and amaze, are amazed that you repeatedly on the pages of Scripture point us to Christ, show us grace, and encourage us to believe, to live, to trust. Father, we ask that you would seal this word to our hearts, that you would encourage us in the faith, and Father, we as your children would continue to grow in this grace and so manifest the life of Christ in our soul. A, a profound mystery, and yet we know it's true that you have chosen to tabernacle among men and through them, through that instrumentality, do a work. Father, we pray you do so even with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.